Welcome once again to Physics 142 Online. In class last time, we worked out the expression for Gauss's Law. And I told you that what it's useful for is being able to find the electric field of certain kinds of charge distributions without having to go through all the hassle involving Coulomb's Law. So what I would like to do now is show you a really simple and actually kind of trivial example of how this works. And the reason it's trivial is if you remember, we used the point charge to figure out what Gauss's law was telling us for the electric flux through a closed surface. Well, now we're going to work backwards. We're going to start with Gauss's law and apply that to a point charge and use Gauss's law to figure out the electric field. So it'll serve as a check to make sure that we get the answer that we expect to get for the electric field of a point charge. So hopefully this isn't, isn't a waste of time, but it does show the general procedure that we'll use in setting up Gauss's Law problems. So a point charge, if we draw the picture uh, on a coordinate axis, if we put the point charge at the origin, we expect that this problem is spherically symmetric. Now a point doesn't seem like a sphere, but if the point were just inflated a little bit, a sphere would be an object that would have the same symmetry. So we would expect that a point charge would have the property that if you're a certain distance away from it, let's say a distance r, that no matter what direction that distance was, the electric field would be the same. And so that means if we draw a sphere centered on the point charge, that the electric field should have the same magnitude everywhere on that surface. Now the direction changes, of course, but the magnitude would be the same. So that motivates us to choose a Gaussian sphere to set up the problem. And so in Gauss's law, the very first step when we have a charge distribution for which we want to find the electric field, the very first step is to figure out what the field lines look like. And that depends on the symmetry of the charge distribution. Once we find out what the field lines look like, then we can choose a surface. As long as it's a closed surface, it doesn't matter. But we can choose a surface that in includes that point charge, that encloses it, and that makes the evaluation of the flux integral in Gauss's law easy. So it'll make more sense after I've shown you the steps. Here's the starting point. Remember that Gauss's law tells us when we have a closed surface, and the circle on the integral sign reminds us it's a closed surface, the flux e dot n hat dA integrated over that closed surface equals the total charge enclosed by the surface divided by the constant epsilon zero. So what we will do first after we've already chosen a surface, because until we choose a surface we can't do the left hand side integral, but once we've chosen the surface we go ahead and evaluate the surface integral. So the left hand side here, we'll just call it LHS. And now let's evaluate this integral. The first thing we want to do is simplify it as much as we can. And we see from the sketch that the electric field vector, no matter where we are on the surface, will point in the radial direction away from the center. And because it's a sphere, the n hat unit vector points in the same direction. So e dot n hat, since e and n hat are parallel, e dot n hat is just e, using the property of dot products. Alright, so then the left hand side, since e dot n hat is just e, has been simplified already. And now, in the very next step, here's the starting point again. The left hand side is integral e dA over the surface of the sphere. The very next step is to realize that that spherical symmetry guarantees that no matter where we are on the surface of the sphere, the magnitude of the electric field is the same. And since the integral is only on the surface, that means E can come outside the integral. Since E has the same value, not the same direction, but the same value everywhere on the surface. So since E comes outside, the left-hand side becomes E times the surface integral dA. We discussed this in class, but just as a reminder, what does this integral mean? It means we're adding up the tiny surface elements dA that together make up the entire surface of the sphere. So 
the sum or the integral of all of those dA areas simply gives us the total surface area of the sphere. And we know that to be 4 pi times the radius squared. So the left hand side simplifies to give us simply E times the surface area of the sphere, which is 4 pi r squared. Look what's happened, by the way. In evaluating the integral, the expression uh, that we have has brought the magnitude of the electric field outside the integral. It's no longer buried inside the integral with some complicated dot product. It came outside, and as a result, when we evaluate the right-hand side, which is our next step, we'll be able to solve for the electric field on the surface. So let's just finish the right-hand side. The right-hand side included Q enclosed over epsilon zero. So we look at our Gaussian surface, which is a sphere. The net charge inside is just Q. That's the point charge. So the right-hand side of Gauss's law will be Q over epsilon zero. So let's put it all together. There's the original form of Gauss's law, okay? The left-hand side, we did that already, that's E times four pi r squared. The right-hand side had the Q enclosed, which is just Q. And so we can now put it all together, E times four pi r squared equals Q over epsilon zero. And the final step is simply to solve for the electric field. That's what we use Gauss's law for, to find electric fields of highly symmetric charge distributions. So for E, we get Q over 4 pi epsilon 0 r squared, and guess what? We wrote this before as KQ over r squared, but K, the Coulomb constant, is the same thing as 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. So this gives us back exactly what we expect for a point charge. And even though this was a particularly simple example, there are lots of other examples where we can take an unknown, or a chart, we can take a charge distribution that has an unknown electric field, and we can use Gauss's law to find that electric field. So let me do one more example to illustrate this. This is a related problem, but it's a little bit different. Rather than a point charge, let's assume that we have a uniformly charged shell. Think of this as a ping pong ball, hollow on the inside, and then all of the charge, Q, is plastered over the surface of a sphere of radius capital R. All right? So the dark circle that we see represents this sphere that has charge on its surface. Again, because the charge is plastered over a surface of a sphere, this problem has spherical symmetry. No matter where I am outside this charged sphere, as long as I stay the same distance away from it, it will presumably have exactly the same magnitude of its electric field. Because no matter what direction I look at this sphere from, it looks the same. So as long as the charge is uniformly distributed, then its properties should be the same as well. They should have spherical symmetry, like the electric field. So this tells me, once again, I will use a spherical Gaussian surface to evaluate Gauss's law because it's that kind of surface that will make the integral easier to evaluate. So let's first look at outside the shell. Remember this shell carries the charge, so let's now look at a Gaussian surface that's a sphere with a radius little r greater than big R. We start with Gauss's law again. Okay, we evaluate the surface integral on the left-hand side, and so we're going to do it on the surface of this larger sphere that encloses the shell. The n-hat vector and the e-vector, again, are parallel to one another. They're both radially outward, so the e dot n-hat becomes e without the vector sign, so it's just the magnitude of the field. The left-hand side then becomes integral eda, and just as we argued before, right, this, this E, we expect this E to be the same magnitude everywhere on the surface of the sphere. So it comes outside the integral. E is constant on the surface. It comes outside. What's left then is just the total surface area of the sphere, 4 pi r squared. So the left-hand side, once again, simplifies to E times 4 pi r squared. And this left-hand side is going to be the same regardless of whether my Gaussian sphere is outside the shell or inside the shell. Everything will be the same. 
The only difference between those two cases is what's the queue enclosed? So if I'm looking at a smaller Gaussian sphere whose radius is less than big R, the charge that that one encloses is zero. Outside the shell, of course, for the Gaussian surface that's larger than the shell, it will enclose a total charge of Q. So both of these can give me answers for the electric field inside the shell and outside the shell. So put it all together. All right, the left-hand side is simply E times 4 pi r squared. The right-hand side now, will the, the Q enclosed will either be zero for the case of a Gaussian sphere less than, or whose radius is less than the shell, or it will be Q for a Gaussian sphere whose radius is greater than the shell, right? So inside the shell, for the smaller Gaussian surface, Q enclosed is zero, so E times four pi r squared is zero, which means E is equal to zero. And this is an interesting property. Any kind of charged object, if we sit inside of it, the electric field is equal to zero. Outside, for the original Gaussian sphere that we drew, e times 4 pi r squared is q over epsilon zero, which gives e is q over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. So this again looks familiar. It is exactly the same electric field that a point charge would have. So the shell, if we're outside the shell, and that shell is a sphere, it not only has the same symmetry as a point charge, it has the same electric field as a point charge. And that makes sense. If we consider this shell to be a sphere of radius r, what if the radius r became really small? In the limit where r got smaller and smaller and smaller, nothing would change. It would have exactly the same symmetry, and eventually it would become a point. So it's not surprising that the electric field outside the shell and the electric field of a point charge are one and the same. But here Gauss's law has revealed to us something new, something we might not have expected, that the electric field, not only at the center of the shell, but anywhere inside the shell, is always going to be zero. So that's an interesting result. Gauss's law gives us useful information that we might not have been able to guess all by ourselves, and we'll continue to do examples like this in class. I'll see you there. Bye-bye.